Pray with me, please. God, we have prepared our hearts with worship. Confess who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. Now, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that you would strip away all of the distractions and the cares and the affairs of our life that have consumed so much of the thoughts of our minds and the desires of our hearts this last week. And we will see again, as we have been seeing in these early chapters in Genesis, the ugliness of our sin and the warnings that your word provides for us, but also the profound hope that even in the darkest times that you are still working. So, Lord, um, help our hearts to be instructed from your word now, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 4. Several weeks ago, I began a sermon with a line from a song from the band King Crimson. Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hands of fools. This morning, the next stanza from that song is appropriate. The wall on which the prophets wrote, in other words, the objective source of truth and revelation, the walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at its seam. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. Who will lay the laurel wreath? as the silence turns to screams. As we arrive at Genesis chapter 4, we find that for the first time, mankind is in possession of instruments of death. And having rejected God's rules, the new knowledge that they have claimed for themselves at the base of the tree will indeed prove to be a deadly friend. As our text opens in Genesis chapter 4, we find Adam and his wife Eve, they are now driven out of the Garden of Eden on account of their sin, and correspondingly, they have been driven away from the face of God. Unless they should think of returning to the garden from which they have now been expelled, an angel with a flaming sword has been placed there to bar their way back to access the garden and access to the tree of life. They have been evicted now from the only home that they have ever known place of beauty and provision and refuge, the garden sanctuary of God. They are now sent out into the world where the wild things are, and things are now much more wild than they have ever been. And it is into this wide, wild world east of Eden that the rest of human history will now unfold. We said last week that one of the lasting consequences for sin in our world is broken relationships. And Adam and Eve are about to experience the painful reality of that truth perhaps far more quickly than they imagined. Our text opens in verse 1, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. So Adam and his wife come together, and the result, according to God's plan for them, is fruitfulness and multiplication. The echoes here of the commission that was given all the way back, it seems so long ago now, in Genesis chapter 1. But yet, all is not quite well, even already in this chapter, because I would suggest to you that Moses provides us a hint, a strong suggestion, that there is pride in Eve's heart that is still at work here. The birth of Cain, she triumphantly exclaims, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, she does at least here acknowledge the Lord's involvement in the birth of Cain, but our English translations somewhat overstate the credit that she's actually giving to God here. Because quite literally, she says, I have gotten a man with the Lord. The verb help that we read is not actually present in the Hebrew. She simply says, I have gotten a man with with the Lord. Our English translations make an interpretive choice here. She seems to be considering herself now a partner with God in the act of man-making. 
And notice that before she acknowledges God here, she first fronts and emphasizes her own achievement in this. I have gotten a man. The fact that she is proud here is, I think, underscored by three other things that we can observe in the immediate context of all that's gone on here. First, she has just been convicted of the crime of desiring to be like God. That was the crime for which sin has now entered into the world and that she's been convicted of beneath a tree. That is what she wanted. That was the promise that lured her to take the forbidden fruit. And now she seems to be emphasizing that like God, she too can create man or at least be his partner in this business. Second, the son for whom she is now proud, Cain, will himself be consumed with pride. In fact, the son that she doesn't speak of, the second son of whom she has nothing to say, is going to be the world's first victim of someone else's pride. And third, the next time that we hear Eve speak after the birth of a child at the end of this very chapter, she's going to sound completely different than how she sounds here. It will sound like someone who has been humbled, who is repentant, and who is now trusting God in faith. But not yet, not here. She still has of yet to taste more of the bitterness of sin before her heart will be humbled. And so Moses here cues off what is about to happen by setting an ominous overtone that will follow through the rest of the chapter of what happens when our hearts are consumed with pride. As we work through this chapter, we're going to observe a few things together, beginning with this thought, sin desires to dominate us. Sin desires to dominate us. Verse 3, in the course of time, God, a Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. So in these opening chapters, the first pair of human brothers, they grow up. And it isn't like there are a whole lot of people in the world at this point. So presumably, these two have spent their entire lives as their mutual companions. They have grown up together in one another's company, spending all of their time with one another. And certainly, the hearts of Adam and Eve must have delighted in these two boys, their first children, the first of all human children. Especially when we consider all of the joy that they have just lost in being cast out of Eden. Their whole world must now have been bound up in these two sons. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly all of what happens in terms of how these boys go in their different ways, but as boys do, they each as they grow up, they choose their own occupations. And and Cain is like his dad. He takes up the family business. He becomes a man of the field, a man of the soil. Abel, on the other hand, becomes a man of the flock. The Bible also doesn't tell us how this first family begins the practice of offering sacrifices to God, or even how they know to offer sacrifices to God. But in any event, both brothers present an offering to God commensurate with their different occupations. Cain from his field, Abel from his flock. Now the natural question that I think we are left seeking to answer is why did God accept Abel's offering and reject Cain's? What happens here? I think some have latched on to this idea that Abel offered a blood sacrifice to God. It was, it was of an animal sacrifice, something of the flock. And so therefore, the form of this offering was more pleasing to God. But I, I think that misses the mark somewhat. We have as of yet nothing in the text that would suggest to us that a, a blood sacrifice would be more pleasing to God than something from the fruit of the ground. And in fact, later in the Old Testament, we will find that both blood and fruit offerings will later be acceptable for different reasons. And there's nothing here that would indicate that there is something unacceptable about the fruit of the ground. Moreover, when God comes to Cain and says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If he had an objection to any other form of offering other than a blood sacrifice, wouldn't he have just said that to Cain? You want to do well, bring me something from a flock. But that's not what God says. I think a closer reading of the text actually gives us the answer to why Cain and his offering are rejected. 
Look again at verses 4 and 5 and notice that it is not just the offering that pleases or displeases God. The text says the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, the Lord had no regard. So it is not just the offering for which the Lord regards, but it also is the heart of the offerer that God regards. God judges not only the actions, he judges the heart of worship. We're given some additional clues here in the text regarding the content of Cain's heart. First, while while Moses is careful to note for us that Abel offers to God of the firstborn of his flock, and then from that firstborn, the fat portions or the best parts of that offering, there is no corresponding mention that Cain has provided the first fruits of his labor. So Abel offers the first and best of what he's received, but the suggestion in the text then is that Cain has kept back for himself the best of what he has received and is offering now to God only the second best offering, which tells us something about Cain's heart. Second, scripture, or from our scripture reading this morning in 1 John, we read that Cain murdered his brother Abel because, quote, his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. But that's the motive for why he killed his brother Abel, meaning that Cain's deeds were already evil before he murdered his brother. So there's something in the heart of Cain. Cain's heart and his actions are evil, and so he's lifting unclean hands and an impure heart in his worship of God. But I I think the third reason that our text gives is actually the most revealing, and that is Cain's response to finding his offering is rejected. And that reveals more than anything else what's really in his heart. But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard, so Cain was very angry. And his face fell. If Cain's intention was really to bring an offering that pleased God, and if his motives were pure in in coming from this desire to worship God in spirit and in truth, then when his offering was rejected, what should his response have been? I think that there would have been humility, there would have been contrition, there would have been repentance. Something like, God, what have I done to merit your displeasure? I want to please you, so tell me, how can I make this right? What can I do? That's the attitude you'd expect. But what do we get? Extreme anger. Sullen depression. The text says, in reference to his anger, quite literally, he burned exceedingly. He is running hot. Our emotions are like indicator lights that tell us what is happening underneath the hood. They are symptoms, our emotions, they are symptoms that are the outer manifestations of the deeper movements of our hearts responding to what is happening in our lives. In their book, Untangling Emotions, Alasdair Groves and Winston Smith say, perhaps one of the most important things that the Bible tells us about our emotions is that they are an expression of what we value or love. Your emotions are always expressing the things that you love, that you value, and and that you treasure, whether you understand them or not. Well, we are getting a strong emotional reaction from Cain. So what do his emotions reveal about what Cain is loving and valuing and treasuring? I think that Cain's anger and his depression tell us that Cain's motivation was never to honor God. Cain's motivation was to honor himself. So when he's publicly humiliated, and God is pleased with his brother and evidently not pleased with him, and everyone can see that Cain's offering is not accepted, but his pride can't handle that because that is what he was worshiping all along, his pride. We are addicted to feeding our pride like an addict is committed to feeding their addiction. And when our pride makes demands that we are unable to meet or that are not satisfied, then our emotions become like a frantic drug addict experiencing withdrawal. Panicking, fretful, angry, incapable of thinking of anything else until what it wants is achieved, is satisfied. 
And as we look at sin's desire to dominate us in this passage, I think that there are three practical warnings that we should take away here. Number one, the design or the desire of sin is mastery of the human heart. That's what it wants. The Lord said to Cain, verse 6, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. It should come as no surprise to us that God is a very good counselor. He begins by asking Cain a seemingly basic and yet truly penetrating question. Cain, why are you angry? It's a question that invites Cain to strip away all of the rationalization, all of the self-justification, all of the reasons that we feed to ourselves that sin uses us to, uses to blind us about the real motivations that we are pursuing, the real desires of our heart. And yet God's question penetrates right through all of that noise. Cain, why? Why are you angry? It's also a question that invites from Cain the opportunity for repentance and restoration. It's as though God is saying to him, because Cain, if you repent, and if you do right, don't you know that I will accept you? That's the offer. The opportunity for right fellowship, right relationship with God is still open. That, that door is still open to him. And so if relationship with God, if worship of God is what Cain was ever really after, that opportunity is still wide open. But there's also a warning here. That if that's not what you desire, Cain, if you're not trying to worship me at all, if you are living for your pride, then know this. Sin is already crouching at your door, and it desires to own you, to have you. The word that God uses here for crouching and desire, these, these words all throughout the Old Testament, they evoke the image of a ravenous predator, like, like a huge predatory cat that is just lurking outside the door that is waiting to pounce upon in order to devour and consume its prey, to have it. It, it reminds us of later when we are told that Satan is like a lion going around seeking whom he can devour. That's the idea. That's what this notion evokes. Well, speaking of lions... The Detroit Lions head coach, Dan Campbell, uh, was asked to see that transition just flawless. <laughs> Dan Campbell was asked earlier this season how it feels to be leading a team that for the first time is becoming the hunted rather than the hunter. It's novel for these Detroit Lions. Coach Campbell replied, well, if you are hunting for us, then you're not going to have to look far. Open up your front door and we'll be waiting for you on your porch. Now, I'd like to know, where has this coach been my whole life? <laughs> you know, that actually sounds quite a bit like God's warning to Cain here. Listen, sin is hunting for you. It's waiting for you. And you're not going to have to go far to find it. Open up your front door, and it's on your porch waiting for you. It's on your doorstep waiting to have you. Which means that this is absolutely a crossroads moment in Cain's life. This is a moment that demands a choice. That will determine the direction of the rest of his life. God is warning him, you will either dominate your sin or it will dominate you. You will either master your heart or it will be the master of you. Which leads to the second warning that we can glean from the text. And that is that the heart directs what we do. The very next verse, verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. We go immediately from God's warning to what Cain does with it. It's a stark moment in my mind. It, Moses presents it in just such a matter-of-fact way, and yet it is shocking. The first human death, and it comes through an act of violence. And not just violence, but brother against brother. To redress a grievance for which the victimized brother is really at no way at fault at all. It just happens to be in the way 
of his brother's pride. And it's hard to comprehend how sin has corrupted creation and so profoundly broken relationships so quickly that this is even possible only the second generation into humanity. How has it come already to this? We read that Cain spoke to Abel, which implies that Cain intentionally lured his brother out into the field. He deceived Abel to coming out with him expressly in order to murder him there. It was a deliberate, intentional, considered, premeditated act of violence. Cain's offended pride, his jealousy for his brother, his desire to avenge his humiliation have so utterly consumed his heart that he will not listen, he cannot listen to God's warning, which ultimately proves, ironically enough, God's warning to be true. That because Cain will not master his heart, his heart will master him. And in the same way, if we do not master our hearts, our hearts will master us. And the problem for us is like Cain, because of our sin, our hearts are desperately wicked, are deceitful, and are consumed with pride. All manner of sin and folly and violence and evil is bound up in the heart of man. Which is why the advice that we hear so often these days of just follow your heart is such profoundly bad dangerous counsel. Look at where following his heart led Cain. The Huffington Post, somebody is really upset about what they followed their heart. <laughs> the Huffington Post published an article, 10 Reasons uh, Why You Should Follow Your Heart. Now, I don't regularly read the Huffington Post. Don't be afraid for my soul. I'm not going to run through all 10 reasons that the Huffington Post gave in their article. I don't think it's that profitable for us, but I'd like to give just two to give a little bit of a flavor of where this article went. So reasons to follow your heart, 10 reasons. Reason number one, following your heart will allow you to love yourself. Reason number two, listen to your heart because your heart knows your true desires. Brothers and sisters, that is not the solution. That is the problem. The problem is that I love myself too much already. That I have too much pride in my heart already. I don't need to be taught to love myself. I come out loving myself. The problem is not that I don't know the desires that I have in my heart. I know the desires that I have in my heart. The problem is that those desires are sinful desires, and as it turns out in the text, not only do I have a desire for sin, but it turns out sin has a desire for me, and it's not for my good. The sin that promises joy and life to me, it leads me to the grave. That's the truth, which leads to the third warning in our text. Sin will not go unpunished. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain apparently hopes that he will manage to escape undetected from his sin. Like his parents, he naively hopes that he can get away with what he's done, that he can hide his guilt. And notice that God actually asks Cain the same questions that he asked of Adam and Eve back in chapter 3. He asks Adam, where are you? And he asks Eve, what have you done? And here he asks Cain, where is your brother? And Cain what have you done? And it's again a surprisingly gentle approach, one that doesn't start with an accusation, but again, an opportunity for confession. The offer to Cain is the same offer that God made to, eat, to Adam, an offer to confess, to repent, and to throw himself on the mercy of God. And Adam, we recall back in Genesis chapter 3, he doesn't take that opportunity. He evades, he misdirects, he seeks to 
get himself out of the predicament that he's in. And Cain is his father's son. And so he lies and he sullenly evades. I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The brazenness and the audacity of that response are staggering. There's no contrition. There's no remorse. There's certainly no repentance to be found anywhere there. But God is a God who is just. God who cares greatly about justice. And God is also a God before whom every supposedly secret act, every supposedly secret thought, every supposedly secret desire of the heart is laid bare before his sight. There is no evading from the sight of God. And if that were not the case, then creation itself, the ground and the blood of Abel, would be crying out to God as a witness for the crime that has been committed here. Cain has allowed his heart to rule him, and now he will feel the painful reality of God's truth spoken to him that sin's desires are contrary to his good. Because now God passes his judgment upon Cain. Starting with the fact that his occupation as a man of the soil, the only thing that he has ever known, the only thing he's ever been good at, that's at an end now. The ground that has received his brother's blood will now in turn reject the hand of Cain. And he is from here forward condemned to live the rest of his life as a fugitive and a wanderer, cut off from community and cut off from fellowship with his family. Now that may actually seem to us Like perhaps not as severe a punishment as we are expecting to happen here. Why is Cain not forfeiting his life for the life of his brother? But we need to remember the promise that we looked at last week back in Genesis 3.15. That from Eve is going to come a future man, a future offspring, the seed of the woman, who is going to deliver humanity from the serpent and from their enemy, death. And Cain is being cut off from the family of promise which means that he's also being cut off from the promised deliverance. The opportunity for repentance is over, and now judgment is at hand. And the judgment means that he will for life and for eternity be removed from access to the deliverance that God promised to humanity. And so Cain, like all who reject God, is being identified as part of the seed of the serpent. Remember back last week? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and your offspring. There will be this ongoing division in humanity between those who by faith connect themselves to the promises of God and the promised line and the promised future deliverer and those who will eternally reject God and reject the promised one to come and who reveal themselves to be as the seed of the serpent. And Jesus himself will make reference to this. In John chapter 8, the religious leaders are rejecting Jesus. And Jesus says to them in John 8, 44, you think you're you're children of Abraham. No, let me tell you who you are. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Now, of course, what are these religious leaders going to do? Well, they're going to seek to kill Jesus, to murder him. And how are they going to do it? By presenting false witnesses. They will murder and lie. They are, as Jesus says, of their father, the devil. He is calling, Jesus is calling the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. He's saying, you're seed of the serpent. You're not children of Abraham. In fact, later, Jesus will explicitly call them, you brood of vipers. And then Jesus says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Well, who committed the first recorded murder in human history? Cain. That's what Jesus says in John's gospel. John picks up on this and carries that over into his epistle. We read this this morning in the scripture reading in 1 John chapter 3. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed, the seed of promise, the seed of the woman, abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. 
And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And what Jesus and John are referring back to is that promise in Genesis 3.15 of enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And they are saying that all those who reject the promises of God and the promised deliverer to come reveal themselves to be seed of the serpent. Even if they have physically descended from Abraham like the religious leaders have. They are children of the devil. They delight in their sin. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And really, this is all of unredeemed humanity, all of unregenerate man. And the very first person to exemplify what it means to be the seed of the serpent is Cain, who murders his brother and then lies about what he's done. He is the one who is of the first, who was a murderer from the beginning and is the father of lies. And so Cain is here cut off from the family of promise, cut off from the promised deliverance to come, which is a fate more damning than any execution would be. Two quick thoughts of application before we move on in our text. First, related to the warnings that we have just considered. Mastering the desires of our hearts is a matter of life and death. Winston Churchill once said that appeasement is like going on feeding the crocodile, hoping that it will eat you last, but eat you it will. We often feed our sin in ways that we think are innocent enough or insignificant enough or harmless enough or in control enough. But the thing about the desires of our sinful heart, they are never satisfied. And every time we feed them, the appetite just grows a little bit larger and the hold on our heart just grows a little bit stronger. And we may think, well, we would never go to the extent that Cain does. We might harbor these sort of innocent little lies in our heart, but we would never act it out the way that Cain, the way that Cain does. But Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says, not so fast. Anyone who has despised or hated his brother is guilty before God of murder. The desires of our heart, these are not innocent little things that we feed. These are the very desires that will consume and dominate and master and kill us. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is not for our good. Its desire is to consume us. So for the sake of our souls, we need to gain a mastery over the desires of our hearts that is only possible through the sin-destroying power of Jesus Christ. The truth is, we cannot overcome the desires of our hearts in our own strength. We can never be the masters of our hearts on our own power. The only way that we can be delivered from the bondage of our hearts to sin is to have a heart that is submitted to Jesus Christ. A second thought of application here. The content of our hearts when we worship God matters. Cain comes to God with unclean hands, with an impure heart, and then he is surprised when God rejects his worship. And later, God will rebuke people who are like Cain in this respect, people who worship God with their lips, but whose hearts are far from him. So know this, you and I, we we can come here every Sunday morning. We can stand here and loudly sing the songs We can open our Bibles and study the Word. We can gather around the communion table. We can go to Sunday school. We can be back on Wednesday nights. Every time the church doors are open, we can be here serving faithfully, doing all of those things. We can do all of it. And we can be fooling all of the people around us, which isn't that great of an accomplishment. People are easily fooled. But God knows the heart. God knows the heart. And lips that praise Him out of a self-loving, self-worshipping heart, don't fool God and don't earn His pleasure. The second significant observation from the text I'd like to make this morning is that from our perspective, it often feels to us as though evil has gotten the upper hand, doesn't it? I think that there are two principal ways that that thought shows up in our text. I actually think that there are three ways. I had to cut the third way. So I'm hoping to talk about that on the podcast this week, which is why we call it the cutting forwards, all the stuff that I don't have time to get into the sermon. You're welcome. I had more points than what we're getting to this morning. So the two 
principal ways, I think this idea shows up in our text, is that God's justice sometimes feels to us to be a little too merciful. And have you ever had the thought that evil people too often just seem to get away with it? Just read the news today and you just think, really? Why do wicked people so often seem to get off so lightly for what they've done? And in fact, to prosper in what they've done. In verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I think we read a text like that and feel that Cain is getting off pretty lightly here. Cain has, in fact, the audacity to claim that his punishment is too harsh for what he's done. And then he goes on to say that what he's really afraid of is that in his wanderings, he's going to be discovered, and those who find him will kill him. The murderer is afraid that he might get killed. That's pretty rich. You want to say to Cain, that's tough. In fact, later when the law will be given, murder is going to require capital punishment, a life for a life. That's going to be the scales upon which justice is measured. So it's hard for us to imagine a more self-focused, a more ironic, a more out-of-touch-with-reality kind of defense than the one that Cain is making here. He clearly doesn't get it. Doesn't get it. And so what is stunning is that God seems to acquiesce to Cain's demands. In fact, God provides Cain with his own divine protection. We're not given the reason why God determines not to take Cain's life, why he spares Cain immediately instead of forcing him to instantaneously pay for the life of his brother. And yet we would be wrong to think that in this, God's justice was in any way lax toward Cain. Cain will live for a time, but he will live as a wanderer who will struggle to survive, and a wanderer with limited human companionship. And he's going to do all of this for the rest of his life, removed from the presence of God, and ultimately, as we said a moment ago, most significantly cut off from the blessing and promises and future deliverance that God is offering, which is a fate that is worse than death. And we read that he moves off to the east. Remember Adam and Eve, when they are cast out of the garden, they are cast out of the east entrance of the garden. This is now a building theme that will continue to develop throughout the book of Genesis, that going to the east is always an indication that you are moving away from the presence and blessing of God. When Abraham and Lot are standing in the land and trying to decide which way they will go, we read, then Lot went east, and you're supposed to go, oh no. That's the thought that is happening here. You're going away from the presence and blessing and face of God when you go to the east. Cain, for his life, will be a wanderer going always eastward. This is why Steinbeck, in his classic novel that depicts all of the grotesque distortions of sin in the world, titled it East of Eden. He was picking up on this very theme. And so while Cain is filled with self-pity, he is ultimately not wrong when he says that his punishment will be very great to bear. It will be very great indeed. But the second connected thought here is that it seems as though things are going from bad to worse and that evil is the thing that's prospering most. Isn't that how we often feel today in our world? I mean, where in the world today do we look around and think, yeah, that's where good is winning? Where do we see that? It feels very much that way in our text in Genesis. For the sake of time, we're not going to read through this morning the rest of Cain's mini-genealogy here. I'll have some more thoughts on that in future weeks. But we're given here seven generations of Cain's descendants that begin with his son Enoch and then down finally to Lamech and Lamech's sons. And near the end of this genealogy, we get to the great, great, great grandson of Cain, this man Lamech. And we read in verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. 
I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So the further along we get down Cain's family tree, the worse things seem to be getting. First, this guy Lamech is the first recorded polygamist in the Bible. He has two wives. He's dismissed the marital and the sexual design of God for humankind. He isn't interested in God's way. He's pursuing his own. And so within only a few generations of Cain's descendants, they are living now in open rebellion against God's created order. But not only is this guy Lamech guilty of a life of sexual perversion, but he's also a man who openly delights in violence. In fact, the pleasure that he takes in his own reputation for power and violence is such that he composes a song or a poem in his own hour, his own honor, which he then uses to glorify his atrocities in this demonstration to his wives. I mean, it's as though he thinks that reciting this poem will win him the greater admiration and esteem of his wives. Or maybe he's just trying to cower them into submission. We don't really know. In any event, he sings this song to his his wives in which he rehearses his own brutality. He boasts that he has killed a man simply for bruising him. That he's killed a young boy simply for striking him. This is an evil man who rejoices in evil. A murderer who delights in the act of murder as the great-great-grandson of the world's first murderer. This poem is frequently referred to as the Song of the Sword. And it speaks to the rapid decline of humanity and of this family in particular. In fact, Lamech says that if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then the vengeance of Lamech is seventy-sevenfold. So those who are like the seed of the serpent, they rejoice in escalating evil. Mankind is here descending into delighting in darkness, exulting in violence, and pursuing perversion. We're four chapters, four chapters in the book of Genesis. We're only one chapter removed from the events of the fall. And already things seem to be going from bad to worse. But just as we are beginning to feel that things are perhaps spiraling out of control, that evil is winning, our attention is drawn back by Moses to Adam and Eve. And we discover the third and final truth this morning, that even in the darkest moments, God's plan is still at work. Verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. The line of promise has not perished with the death of Abel, even if that is what Satan imagined might happen, nor has the line of promise been corrupted by Cain, because there is another son, Seth, the one whose name means appointed one. And notice the difference in Eve this time around when this son is born. Before, when Cain was born, she said, I have gotten a man with the Lord. Now she says, God has appointed for me another offspring. She has watched with grief and the heartache of a mother of how her pride entered into the heart of her son and destroyed him and his brother. Imagine being Adam and Eve and knowing as they watched what happened to their sons that it was a direct consequence of their own rebellion to trust God when he said, on the day that you eat of this, you shall surely die. But there's now a profound change in Eve, and I believe what we are witnessing in her is faith and repentance at work. Repentance because she is humbled here from her pride. She gives God alone the glory for the birth of this child, and faith because she seems here to be looking for the seed of promise that God had offered her in Genesis 3.15. She is looking for the man who God will appoint to crush the head of the serpent. And even after the loss of one son and the exile of another, she is still trusting in the promises of God that he will give her the descendant that will defeat their enemy. We read that after the birth of Seth and then Seth's son Enosh, that people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Moses is here intentionally contrasting what happens with Cain's line with what happens to Seth's family. And Moses is telling us 
Seth's family, this is it. This is the line of promise. Watch them, follow them, see what God is going to do through them. And that will be the movement of the rest of the book of Genesis. The darkness of human sin and corruption will only continue to grow from here. Lamech's song of the sword will in many respects become the anthem of sinful humanity. Men who love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, we're often tempted, I think, to despair. Despair because we struggle to control our own sinful desires that we see welling up in our own hearts, that we find when we look within two sets of desires that are warring within us and we struggle to gain mastery over our hearts, even as we feel sin endeavoring to gain mastery over us. And despair because as we look around, we see almost everywhere that it feels as though evil is winning. The streets are filled with violence. Sexual perversion is celebrated. Moral norms have been replaced with moral chaos. The bastions of culture have become purveyors in evil. The world is on fire. These are days of darkness. But the end of Genesis chapter 4 reminds us that even when things seem very dark, that even when we cannot see the light, that God is still at work and that he is still keeping his promises. Because someone from Seth's line would one day come, the man who Eve was looking for. And the descendants of the brother murdering Cain will proclaim their delight in vengeance that is 77-fold. Because they are like the seed of the serpent. They are children of the devil, and he was a murderer from the beginning. And so their theme will be 77-fold vengeance. Then we come to the gospel of Luke and the coming of the promised seed of the woman in the person of Jesus Christ. And we get this genealogy. And Luke records 77 individuals in the line that lead to Christ. And this seed of promise will one day tell his disciples that those who are like him, those who delight in him, will be marked by the fact that they forgive their brother 77 times. Now, where did Jesus get that number, do you think? He is looking at the seed of the serpent, and he is saying, I am claiming some for me. The first coming of the seed of promise of Jesus Christ was a time of meekness. He came as the suffering servant who died in our place for our sins. And he was rejected by men because men love darkness rather than light. But he is coming again. And when he does, this time it will not be in meekness. It will be in glory and in strength and in power and justice and judgment. And when he comes, all wrong things will be made right. He will avenge the innocent. He will judge the guilty. He will award justice for every evil, either in the cross or in hell. And so as we sometimes look around and are tempted to despair, we need to recognize that we have hope even in these dark days because God is still working. His promises are still true and he remains faithful to what he has promised. And if this justice at times seems to us a little bit long in coming, And Scripture reminds us that it is the long-suffering mercy of God that restrains even now that final judgment. And it is that long-suffering mercy of God that has allowed sufficient time for you and I to sit and stand in that mercy even today. So that still today, sinners can now, even now, turn from their sin and still receive mercy because the appointed hour has not yet come. Friend, if that is you today, if you see where the desires of your heart will lead you and are leading you, that they are leading you to the grave. And if you would today turn to Christ, know this, there is still time. Do not be like Cain, whose desires led him to wander away forever from the presence of God and be cut off from the promises of deliverance and the freedom of a heart that is no longer in bondage to sin but is submitted to Christ. But instead, even this morning, Come unto Jesus. Let's pray.
Father, we have seen in your word two truths. That the desires of our hearts that seek to gain mastery over us, they are not for our good and that we must master them. And yet we know that in our own power we are hopeless and helpless to be able to accomplish that mastery. And yet we have also seen that even in dark moments and dark days where there seems to be no light, that your promises are true and that you are still working. And Father, you are still working in our hearts. And so we give you honor and praise and glory that you have delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and delivered us into the light of your beloved Son. Lord, I pray that if there are those here this morning who have not submitted their hearts to Jesus, that you would even this morning through your spirit convict and cause a turning in repentance while there is yet time. We ask these things in Christ's name.